Well, welcome to City First Church. We got pyro today. I didn't think you expected that in church. Got here early. I said, Ryan, we got pyro. I said, it feels hot. They said, it's cold. Put your hand over it. I said, you go first. I'm not, I'm not doing it. They said, I can call on pyro at any point in today's message. I said, are you serious? I said, so if I said, let's make some noise for Jesus, they could just, bam, pyro. That was your key. That was the moment. That was the moment. You see, it's there. It, we're, we're, we're working on it. Don't worry. It's going to come at, at a moment you're not expecting it, okay? I'm going to give you an opportunity to make Jesus the Lord and Savior of your life today, and then we're going to pyro it like, like crazy for you. So excited that you're here as we continue this series called At the Movies, looking at a movie called Hidden Figures. Jesus used parables in, in, the, in the Scripture it was an agricultural society, so a lot of the stories that he told have to do with farming and planting and seeds, and in our modern day stories are movies, and so we're looking at these Hollywood flicks and seeing what biblical truths we can pull out of it, and we're looking at this, this movie, Hidden Figures. I, I, I really like this movie. There's, there's people in it that are, well, they're often hidden, and, and it's about three African-American women who are helping NASA put a man in space, you know, the, the, they were in a race with the Soviet Union, the United States was, and, and some of you may know this, some of you may not, but um, I get to do quite a bit of work in, in corporate America, and whenever I do that, I always try to listen for common denominators amongst people, and the number one thing that I've noticed in working with people in church and in corporate America is that there is always inevitably somebody in the organization Somebody who's maybe even a volunteer who is carrying a large amount of weight in that organization and not getting credit for it. There's inevitably somebody who's behind the scenes working their tails off and they're rarely pointed out. And I've just found that when talking with people, they just often feel so undervalued in their personal life and in their professional life. In fact, I, I don't know anybody that feels overvalued. Do you? Have you, have you met anybody that just goes, you know what, I just I kind of feel overvalued here. People are always emailing me about how awesome am I am. I'm just kind of sick of it, you know? No, mo- most people, they, they, feel, they feel undervalued. So we're going to talk about today, and I believe that any one of us can find ourselves at a place in our life or career where we absolutely feel like a hidden figure. So uh, to kick off Uh, Today's message, I want you to go ahead and check out this clip. In the world of NASA, back in the 1960s, computers were not machines. They were people. Catherine, an up-and-coming computer who is brilliant beyond compare, is assigned to join a special task force in an effort to win the space race. As the only African-American woman in that division of the task force, she must deal with an exorbitant amount of discrimination based on her race. The scientists and engineers around her do not view her as an equal, but Catherine remains steadfast in her work and aims to put her brilliance on display for all to see. Have you ever been there? Have you ever been in that place where you walked in a room and you wanted to be seen and known, but it just didn't quite fit right? It's kind of like walking into a lunchroom for the first time and you're figuring out where you belong. And we get that as kids, but it, it, it hits a little bit different when you're in your 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s, and you're still trying to figure out out if people in the room can even see you. Not only if they can see you, but how they see you. Sometimes people will put you in a box to make themselves feel better about you. And so you're trying to figure out, do I fit the, the box? Do I, do I not? Especially when you're different than they are and you're going, am, am I, was I put on this planet to fit in or was I put on this planet to to stick out, but I don't want to stick out for all of the wrong reasons. What I hope today's message does for you and for me is that I hope it helps us fall out of love with the spotlight and fall in love with the shadows. Today's message is for all those shadow people, for all the people doing all of the hard work behind the scenes and you never got credit. What if I told you God could meet you right there in the dark? 
What would you do if I just told you, like, hey, right there, like, you could just be faithful right there behind the scenes, and, like, that would be enough for your life. In fact, um, I want to, God bless you, um, I, I want to look at a couple of hidden figures in Scripture, some people that don't get a lot of spotlight, uh, some people that don't often get preached about. Um, so, so one you may have heard of, uh, he has a, a book named after him, but we don't know a whole lot about his life, and some others, they just kind of they just kind of get honorable mention here and there. And the first uh, group of people I want us to look at is actually a couple that Paul mentions in the New Testament a few times. The first time we see it is in Acts chapter 18. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had ordered all Jews to leave Rome. Paul went to see them, and because he was a tent maker as they were, he stayed and worked with them. When we first meet Aquila and Priscilla, and I just like that their names rhyme, like what an awesome couple, you know what I mean? Like just Priscilla and Aquila, like it just goes together. But when we first meet them, we are told that they have come from Corinth, from Italy, as victims of Roman persecution, not for their Christian faith, but because Aquila was a Jew, and the emperor at that time had expelled all Jews from Rome, and it was deemed unsafe for any Jew to remain a part of Italy. So Aquila and Priscilla found their way to Corinth and settled there, pursuing their jobs as tent makers. These are not famous Bible people. They're hidden Italian figures who just make tents. They're wholesalers for Cabela's, okay? Like, but they're a crucial part of starting and helping the Corinthian church. Later in Acts 18, uh, there is this new eloquent speaker that comes into town, and the scripture says that meanwhile, a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was a learned man with a thorough knowledge of the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and he spoke with great fervor and taught about Jesus accurately, though he knew only the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they invited him to their home and explained to him the way of God more adequately. This is a couple that finds themselves simply mentoring in the shadows someone who's in the spotlight. I mean, like, they're just taking care of the guy that's getting all of the press. They're just going, hey, like, hey, man, I understand you're, you, you're a young gun and it's great, but man, there's some things that you, you don't know and I'm willing to, to mentor you without getting all of the shine. And this Apollos dude wasn't easy to mentor. And we can see that later in 1 Corinthians 16 when Paul puts a little bit of his business out there in the streets. It says, now about our brother Apollos, I strongly urged him to go to you with the brothers. He was quite unwilling to go. Paul, you ain't have to tell everybody that. That could have stayed between you and us. Why you got to put that all in the business? Why the whole church got to hear about this? That's, that, that ain't necessary. But he says, uh, but he will go when he has the opportunity Good speaker, but stubborn, I'm guessing. Nevertheless, you can't tell Paul or Apollo's story without Priscilla and Aquila. At the end of Romans, we see a greeting that Paul gives Priscilla and Aquila. It says, Greek, Priscilla and Aquila, my co-workers in Christ Jesus, they risked their lives for me. Not only I. But all the churches of the Gentiles are grateful for them. You know what I just felt called to do this weekend? I just felt like I was supposed to encourage someone who feels like their work is insignificant. I felt like I was just supposed to encourage someone that feels like their life is insignificant. Because scrolling on social media can make you feel like your life is insignificant. Pulling up to a football game and seeing other families get out of a nicer car, a nicer electric car, can make you feel a little insignificant. Watching somebody else get asked to go to homecoming can make you feel a little bit insignificant. Seeing somebody else get promoted can make you feel insignificant. But one of the verses I felt like I was supposed to encourage you with today is Matthew 6, 3. It says, 
But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret. Then your Father, and you got to see this, then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Some of us are hoping that some people are watching us. But I got some good news for you. God's watching. In the dark where he, he can see everything. And I think the temptation for all of us is to be awesome and show it. But one of the most powerful things that you and I can do is be faithful to what God has called us to in secret and trust God with the rewards. If we're honest, really honest, we're putting our hope in our employers to give us rewards. We're hoping algorithms will make something we post go viral. But what I love about Priscilla and Aquila is they were just tent makers who the scriptures tell us were willing to risk their lives for the gospel of Jesus on the low and support Paul and the church without all of the press. Can you imagine if we got to that same place too? I want you to begin to fall in love with the shadows. In this next clip, we see Catherine in the movie growing in her position, but also experiencing some opposition in the process. So go ahead and check out this clip. Since the restrooms are segregated, Catherine is forced to walk over a mile to go to the bathroom multiple times a day. While her smarts have earned her some level of respect among her colleagues, there is still discrimination present. The leader of the space task force becomes irritated at Catherine's absence, not knowing the true reason why she disappears throughout the day. Catherine stands up for herself, opening the eyes of her colleagues to the level of discrimination she faces each and every day at NASA. In response to her speech, the leader of the Space Task Force makes an executive order to remove all segregated bathrooms at NASA. You know, sometimes I think we, we, we look at how we might feel hidden, we feel like how we might feel undervalued, and whenever we get into that place, it can kind of become all about us. But what if we began to be the kind of people that says, I wonder if there's somebody else that feels undervalued, that I could do something for, that I could leverage my influence for them. Because I, I think as much as you might feel undervalued today, I just I just got a feeling that there's somebody in your job, there's somebody in your class, there's somebody in your life who feels perhaps even more undervalued than you do. And you get to be the kind of person that lets them know that that's not the truth. Like, I think you should find a friend, a colleague, a teammate, a family member this week and just let them know, hey, you're not going to go undervalued on my watch. Why? Because I, I'm going to decide to be that person to let them know that their hard work isn't for nothing, that they're not a nobody, that you see their contribution. And at some point, I think you and I have to stop worrying about who's not seeing us and start focusing on who we can start celebrating. One of the things I love about Romans 16, it's one of the most underrated chapters in the Bible. I like to call it uh, the Apostle Paul's Twitter account, and this is what he's doing in it. He's just mentioning people. It's just shout outs. Like, he's just throwing out what I believe to be a bunch of hidden figures. He starts off Romans 16 verse 1, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, not from friends, a deacon of the church. He's like, I ask you to receive her in the Lord in a way worthy of his people and to give her any help she may need from you, for she has been the benefactor of many people, including, including me. In, in verse 6, he says, greet Mary who worked very hard for you. In verse 7, he says, greet Andronikas. Andronikas. Any Andronikas in the building today? 
Wanya, my fellow Jews who have been in prison with me, they are outstanding among the apostles, and they were in Christ before I was. Verse 12, greet Tryphena and Tryphosa. Is there Tryphosa in the building? No? Okay. Um, those women who work hard in the Lord, greet Rufus. Guarantee there's a Rufus in the building. Guarantee it. At least one watching online, chosen in the Lord and his mother who has been a mother to me. Too. Paul is going through all of his followers and he's like, man, let me just, let me just show some love. What about you? Is there anybody in your life that you can recommend? Who can you celebrate? Who can you shout out? Who can you point out? I know we wish someone was doing it for us, but sometimes you have to do for others what you wish someone was doing for you. Can I encourage somebody this weekend who's at a job they tolerate? Don't let your employer determine your character. You might work in the most toxic environment. That does not mean you have to be toxic. In fact, I pray it is toxic. You want to know why? Because then at least they got you. At least then you can stand out. It actually means you got an opportunity to be different, okay? I just meet way too many people who let their employer dictate the direction of their, of their life and the kind of person they're becoming. Just because your employer may never change doesn't mean that you can in Hidden Figures, Catherine is, is really smart, but at, at one point she's replaced by a computer who could technically work faster than she could, and so unfortunately she was, she was demoted, but that wasn't how her story ended, so go ahead and check out this clip. It's launch day, and as a mission control gears up for launch, there seems to be a miscalculation of the new IBM supercomputer that is responsible for calculating the coordinates of the launch. With time running short, Catherine is back into mission control in order to verify the math of the rocket's re-entry. Holding the life of astronaut John Glenn in her hands, Catherine once again proves her prowess as a rocket scientist and verifies the math in inhuman time. The mission is a go and it's all thanks to Catherine. Get Catherine Gobel. You know sometimes I think we have to just be really good at our jobs and let our work speak for itself. The last hidden figure I want us to look at is a man named Mark. He's also known as John Mark, a young man whose mother hosted early believers in her home in Jerusalem. He traveled with Paul and Barnabas on their first missionary journey. This is the same Mark who is the writer of the Gospel of Mark. Historians believe the Gospel of Mark is largely stories compiled of Peter's eyewitness accounts on the stories of Jesus some scholars believe that Mark could have been one of the followers of Jesus from a distance, but wasn't one of the original 12. Nevertheless, it's not his gospel that I want you to zoom in on this weekend. It's what Paul said about him at the end of 2 Timothy in comparison to others. Dear Timothy, do your best to come to me quickly, for Demas... Now, again, Paul loves putting other people's business in these streets, in these biblical streets. He says, for Demas, because he loved this world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. You're like, man, Demas, bruh, what was you doing? And then in verse 14, he says, Alexander, the metal worker, did me a great deal of harm. The Lord will repay him for what he has done. My God. We get to heaven, we, every Alexander we meet, we're going to say, the metal worker? My, what did you do, you know? Doesn't have a great reputation, but then here's what the Apostle Paul says about Mark in verse 11. He says, uh, get Mark. Hey, Timothy, I need, you to, I need you to get Mark and bring him with you because he is helpful. To me and my ministry. I don't know where Mark was at this point in his life, but I could only imagine what it was like being in the shadows, watching all the other disciples and apostles get called upon and have all these amazing stories about it. But here's 
John Mark in the shadows just being helpful? What, what if you just became the most helpful person the people in your life do? What, what, if, what if you became just the most helpful person at your job? What if you just started reading a book a month and just said, you know what? Hey, guys, I've been reading a book, and I just, I just thought this would be helpful. You, you do that three years in a row, you won't be in the same position. Because you just decided, I'm just going to be one of those people that is helpful. You don't have to market yourself. The, the greatest marketing strategy you have is by being really good at your job and being helpful to everyone else. Imagine if today you went home to your spouse while football rules your household for an afternoon and you just looked at your wife and said... How can I be helpful today? Now, I know you're thinking, Ryan, the devil is a liar. I can be helpful on Monday. But listen, but just imagine if you paused what's so important for who's so important to you. And and ladies, what if you looked at your man and you said, hey, how can I be helpful today? How can I be helpful this week? Teenagers, if you go home and say this to your parents, they will pass out, okay? You want to be helpful. What do you, what, what, do they give you drugs at City First today? Is that in the communion? What they got in there? What is it? Did you get baptized? What's in the water? I mean, just imagine if we all just went to where we're going to be this week and just say, hey, you know, I've just been thinking, I, I probably could be a little bit more helpful. That's the last thing I want to encourage you with this weekend is to continue to be a person that's helpful. That if you, just, if you want to be the kind of person that says, I want to change the world, you should just ask every person you meet, hey, is there anything I can do for you? Is there anything I can help you with? You do that long enough, you'll be surprised how being helpful will actually help you. It's easy to live with a mindset of I'll be helpful I'll go out of my way for others when somebody else does it for me first. I got good news for you today. Somebody already did. His name is Jesus Christ. He's already gone out of his way for you. We're we're not people that just, well, I'm just naturally happy. I'm just naturally kind. Oops, I'm generous. No, that's not us. No, we're, we're the people that won the eternity jackpot. And, 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 and in light of what we've been given, yeah, we just, of course we want to be those kinds of people. Hey, with every head bowed and every eye closed, I want to give each and every person to make Jesus the Lord and Savior of your life. Maybe for you, you, you struggle in your position in life. Maybe you feel unseen and and don't really feel like being the type of person that goes and values others and sees others. But it's amazing what can come out of you when you know what's been put in you. When you know what has been given to you that you did not deserve. Jesus Christ was sent to the planet to stand in the gap for you and for me. And when we trust Him with our lives and surrender our lives to Him, it is amazing the kind of people that we can be if, if You're here today and you say, I want to be that kind of person. Maybe you want to give your life to Jesus for the first time. Maybe you want to rededicate your life to Christ with every head bowed and every eye closed. If that's you, would you just slip up your hand and say, Ryan, that's me. Ryan, that's me. I see your hand, man. That's awesome. Is there anybody else? I see your hand. That's awesome. Anybody else? Anybody else? Okay, can we all repeat this prayer after me? Say, Jesus, thank you for dying on a cross for my sins. I ask now that you would be the Lord and Savior of my life. I surrender my past and my future to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said, amen.
Thank you for joining us. We hope you've been encouraged today. We say this all the time. We're not just a friendly church, but a family church. And we want you to know that we are here for you. If you need prayer for anything, we would love to come alongside you and pray with you. Simply visit our app and tap the Get Connected button. You'll also find resources on how you can take your next steps in your faith journey. Here at City First Church, we are passionate about generosity. And when we give, we are able to impact people globally in Jesus' name, bringing practical help and hope. If you were encouraged today, we would invite you to partner with us financially and give back to God through City First Church. Giving is simple. Click the link in the description or head on over to the app. We are so grateful for your generosity. Lastly, if you're watching on YouTube, make sure to like and subscribe. Thanks again for tuning in here at City First Church. We'll see you next time.